I'm back once again to answer a bunch of your questions. This is Probing Paul, episode number 71 for April 2022. This is my monthly Q&A, and not only do I have some tantalizing and scandalous questions to answer, I also have some items that have arrived to my P.O. box, so I'll be opening those up for mail time, and I'm gonna start off with the consummate question in terms of PC building, and that is the ultimate ongoing battle between AMD and Intel. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Kyoxia's family of NVMe SSDs, featuring their latest Bix 3D flash memory. The BG5 now supports PCIe 4.0 and is still available in the incredibly small M.2 2230 form factor, so it's a great fit for gaming PCs, laptops, and compatible handheld gaming devices. And for enterprise or hyperscale data center use, the CD7 and XD6 feature the new EDSFF or Enterprise and Data Center Standard form factor for ease of integration, while the CD7 supports PCIe Gen 5 for maximum performance when paired with the latest AMD Epic or Intel Xeon server hardware. For more on Kyoxia SSDs, click the sponsor link in the video description. Quick reminder before we get started, all the questions I'm answering today were taken from the comment section of the last episode of Probing Paul, so you can check out the Probing Paul playlist if you'd like to see older episodes. You can leave a comment down below if you'd like me to answer it next month. But as you can see, the Probing Paul playlist goes very far back in time. You can even almost see back to those heady days before I used dark mode. But our first question is from Pinky Tech. What's up, Pinky Tech? What are your thoughts on the Intel versus AMD CPU race. It seems like we're going to be in a pattern of each overtaking the other during each launch, which means healthy competition. And yes, Pinky Tech, I totally agree with your assessment there. But part of the reason I wanted to answer this question today is because I think we're in a pretty good position in terms of CPUs that are currently on the market and available, as well as CPUs that we're anticipating to be coming out later in the year. But let's talk about AMD first. And in the past five years, AMD has been rolling with their AM4 platform. When it originally came to market about five years ago, AMD was very upfront and they said, this is going to be our platform through 2020 at least. And now it's 2022 and they've just launched what is probably going to be their final CPU for that platform, which is the 5800X 3D. And I have a full video up on this chip if you're interested. It is a very good performer in terms of gaming. It is also an eight core CPU. So in terms of CPU performance, it's a little bit more middle of the road. But I have given AMD a lot of credit, uh, first off, for starting the AM4 platform off with that sort of longevity announcement and saying, hey, we're going to be supporting this for like a good three years at least. And then they even went a little bit above and beyond that with launches in 2021 and now in 2022. Combine that with the fact that Intel for quite a few years was just sort of kicking the can down the road with their 14 nanometer architecture, making slight changes here and there, but sticking with a four core, eight thread approach for most of their mainstream CPUs and only really changing their MO after AMD had achieved some success with the AM4 platform. And people started to be like, look, even though the uh, instructions per clock performance, the single core performance of those early Ryzen 1000 and 2000 series CPUs was still pretty decently behind what Intel had available at the time, they were offering six core and eight core parts and eventually 12 core and 16 core. And I think consumers saw a lot of value in the added CPU horsepower that AMD was bringing to the table, sort of the contrast that they were providing from what Intel Intel was doing for honestly way too long. And then the other issue that Intel had in the later half of the 2010s was that they had been working on their 10 nanometer lithography microarchitecture for quite some time, and they were having challenges actually producing that in volume. I was actually very surprised with what Intel did in the later half of the 2010s. I was expecting them to be more competitive with AMD's Ryzen offerings a little bit earlier on. But ultimately, Intel wasn't able to bring a true 10 nanometer part to the desktop until the launch of their 12 series, which again, I reviewed back when they launched uh, later in 2021. So even though you can easily criticize AMD for how they position their 5000 series in terms of pricing, once they had actually launched CPUs that were outperforming Intel's offerings in pretty much every category, they stuck to the higher end, didn't provide like $200 options and below for the 5000 series until just recently. So it was almost like Intel and AMD changed positions. Intel became the underdog offering more budget friendly options. And AMD suddenly had the most appealing processors with the 5000 series, but they were all uh, pretty expensive. If you wanted to dive in with the latest technology, you had to spend probably at least $300 for 5600X for quite some time. But bringing the discussion back to how the market looks today, I think we're in a pretty good position as consumers because things have gotten 
gotten so uh, heated and competitive between AMD and Intel. I think Intel saw some of the writing on the wall with the, the success of the AM4 platform and with LGA 1700, they've at least made a little bit more of a promise that we're at least gonna have two generations on that platform. So Intel's 13th gen core processors launching later in the year will be able to slot into current LGA 1700 motherboards. And for anyone who's buying right now, that might be an incentive to go team blue. As for AMD, even though AM4 has been a great platform for quite some time, all good things must eventually end or however that depressing quote goes. So AM4 is going to be going end of life later this year. So for people who are looking for something to buy right now, that might be something to consider. Waiting for AM5 to launch might be a viable option. Just going Intel instead so you have a potential upgrade path with 13th gen might be something to do. But also with AM4, because even the 5000 series CPUs are backwards compatible, there's plenty of B450, B550 and X570 motherboards on the market. So even though AMD was late in launching some of their more budget friendly options in the 5000 series, like, like the R5 5600 and the R7 5700X, there are plenty of those on the market right now. So it makes it a tough choice to say, go ahead and buy this or go ahead and buy that. There's no clear winner. And usually when that's the case, it means we're in a competitive situation, which tends to drive prices down. And then you're just in a situation where it's just, it's hard to get a straight answer from someone like me. So that's kind of my high level assessment of the current competitive CPU situation between AMD and Intel, but I'm really excited for the launches later in the year. I think Intel finally has felt the heat from the flames of the fire that AMD lit under their butt. So they're moving things more towards an enthusiast and consumer friendly direction. And then AMD with the 5800X 3D launch showed us how much performance improvement could be had just from a packaging technology and the 3D vCache that they enabled. So it'll be really cool to see that technology applied to their next gen CPUs which are going to be manufactured on TSMC 5 nanometer. So lots to be excited about later in the year. And I'm glad that the answer to the question, should I go AMD or Intel is not just very clear one or the other. It being a more muddy answer is a good thing. Next question from Andres Ruiz. Uh, hey Paul, greetings from Argentina. Greetings right back to Argentina. Thank you for loving my content. Do you think Ste SteamOS will eventually be mature enough to open the door for a user-friendly Linux distro for gamers on PC. And I think lots of people would agree with you that not having to deal with Microsoft would be a good thing. This is definitely a question that's been asked before, but I think the more recent development of the Steam Deck is the catalyst that might sort of change how things have been going in this area. When it comes to developing video games, a lot of companies are very conservative about how they like to go about doing that. And what they most want to see is an established user base that's already out there that might be interested in playing the game that they're are developing. And I should point out, it's not just game developers we're talking about here, but companies like AMD and Nvidia who might uh, do driver support, because that's an important factor in terms of the hardware, the operating system, and the software that's running on it as well. But because Valve took the risk in developing the Steam Deck hardware, which has been received very positively so far, and is achieving a level of success that I don't think we've really seen before in terms of a handheld PC gaming device, but just the fact that it exists, it is a gaming PC at its core, and the install base or the user base for that device is growing steadily every day. They are sold out for many, many months in the future. But now that that audience is there and you have Valve behind it backing it, the library of Steam games that work with SteamOS uh, appears to be growing just about every day. And if you compare that to something like VR, which is still there and is still growing, but I think still uh, exists in a little bit of a niche side of PC gaming, but especially when VR headsets were first starting to come out, it took a while for them to gain adoption. There was a big upfront cost associated with the headsets themselves, as well as the PC gaming hardware you needed to power it. Whereas the Steam Deck you can buy for what was 450 bucks for the cheapest model, 450 to six or $700. And it has appeal for people who might not necessarily just be PC gamers. They might've just been console gamers or handheld gaming enthusiasts in the past who are like, hey, I see that Steam Deck, I've heard good things about it. I wanna jump on there too. But if the audience is there, you have eyeballs and people with wallets to sell the product to, yes, I think we'll see the development work and the investment in the platform uh, continue and SteamOS will continue to mature as a viable alternative platform for PC gaming. And to my mind, the greatest upshot from this would be more competition for Microsoft, more competition for Windows, because Microsoft makes all sorts of decisions about Windows. Some of them were like, hey, that was a pretty reasonably good decision. Often we're like, Microsoft, what the heck are you doing? But Windows is still the go-to platform for PC gaming. SteamOS being a very viable alternative to that, I think would keep Microsoft a little 
little bit more honest and provide a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more incentive for them to continue making gamer focused decisions that help us versus decisions that just help them harvest our data or do whatever stupid things they're doing with Windows 11. Next question from Cesare Dabrowski. Uh, great show. Thank you, Cesare. In a custom loop, do you set a temperature curve for a water pump or do you just leave it at 100% uh, full time? There are two ways that I've gone about setting the uh, RPMs or the, just the speed on the water pump in the past. One is to access the control settings for whatever motherboard three or four pin header you have the pump plugged into and to adjust that either in the BIOS or within the operating system using software. But I'll just listen to the pump and I'll set it to 100% speed and then I'll start to steadily reduce it until I can't hear the pump anymore. And sometimes that's maybe around 65 to 75% speed. Then I'll just leave it there and I'm good to go. And I think that's a reasonable way to go about doing things. Of course, if you do that, you're not taking advantage of your motherboard's ability to dynamically set the speed for any fan header typically on the motherboard. So yeah, setting a curve based on a temperature in the system is reasonable as well. But here, if you have the ability to, I would set that curve based on the water temperature in your loop rather than like your CPU temperature or your GPU temperature. Under full load, the liquid in your custom loop probably shouldn't be getting hotter than maybe 60 degrees, maybe 70 degrees Celsius maximum. Some all-in-one coolers have sensors built into them. So if you just plug the USB into the motherboard, you can use the software to access the all-in-one liquid coolers temperature readout for the actual coolant. If you're building a custom loop, you might need to get a specialized fitting that has a water temperature sensor built into it. And then you can feed that over to one of the uh, temperature sensor headers that are on your motherboard. And a lot of mid-range to higher end motherboards have temperature sensor headers that you can just plug in. And here again, I would set the maximum speed just by ear based on how much noise the pump is making. And I try to get it down to a point where I can't really hear it. And then at the low end, you probably want to go with 25 to 30% pump speed just to make sure that there is liquid flowing through the loop, even if you're just idling and not really doing anything with the system. Next question from Tim Longson. Question for next month. Will 2022 be the year we see hardware released that will allow 8K gaming at playable refresh rates, like with a 4090 Ti and overclocking and custom water cooling and everything? So 8K is a term you probably hear tossed around a lot, but what is it actually? 8K resolution, at least according to this PC Mag article, is 7680 by 4320, which is basically double the resolution in terms of the numbers here than 4K. But when you double both the X axis and the Y axis, it actually quadruples the number of pixels that you are working with. So, so all you gotta do is do the math, assume the X is just a multiplier, and uh, 4K is a little over 8 million pixels. 8K is over 33 million pixels, four times the amount of pixels. So it's not going to be twice as difficult for your graphics card to render. It's going to be four times as difficult for your graphics card to render. Theoretically, of course, there are other factors that go into what a graphics card is capable of than just resolution. But let me refer back to a slightly older video on my channel called Are We Ready for 4K? Uh, which is a video I posted on April 10th, 2014, which is about eight years ago, actually just over eight years ago. So consider first off that this was eight years ago, and I would say right now 4K is only just becoming a little bit more widespread and adopted in terms of PC gaming. And again, that's partially just because it is very challenging for graphics cards to output that resolution. In this set of tests, I was testing a Titan Black in single and two-way SLI. I was testing Radeon 290Xs, which were the fastest cards from uh, Radeon at the time. Again, in a two-way crossfire configuration, and those were actually water-cooled uh, with some custom units from NZ. ZXT. And then I did some overclock settings. And then uh, at the time, the GTX 780 Ti was the top of the range in terms of non-Titan cards from NVIDIA. So I also tested those in single and two-way configurations. But yeah, at the time, throwing just about the best hardware possible at 4K, we were barely, actually not even, able to hit 60 frames per second in games like Metro Last Light, Crisis 3. I guess we did get up to, you know, 60 to 65 FPS in Battlefield 4. So all this is to say that it's relatively easy, or I guess I should just say easier to create an 8K display as like a TV manufacturer than it is to create a graphics card or graphics solution that can push a uh, high resolution 3D rendered image with like a 4K AAA game title at that resolution at the same time. Also in the in-between, we've had other advances in display technology that also have an impact on a GPU's ability to render a frame. And that includes things like color depth and HDR. And it also includes the trend of going higher refresh rates than 60 Hertz. It jumped to 120, 144, now 240 and 360 are pretty common. So I would say no, it is very unlikely that with the launch of the 40 series from Nvidia or the 7000 series from AMD Radeon that suddenly 
8K gaming is going to be a thing. Yes, there will be some titles that you can run at 8K just because they're less graphically intensive titles like I don't know, Minecraft or something like that. But for my money right now, I'm more interested in 4K and I guess to a slightly lesser extent 1440 still because that is still a more reasonable budget option for PC gamers who are looking to purchase a monitor that they can actually game on. But 4K resolution at higher refresh rates and better color depth has more appeal to me right now than 8K because I think at that level of detail, it becomes much more difficult to distinguish the difference even between the two resolutions, especially when you consider how much more difficult it is for the graphics card to output that resolution. Next question from Juan Gonzalez. Hey Paul, just bought an AMD 5800X and a tough B550 Plus motherboard, but he's been hearing me talk about stuff like I talked about in that first question with AM5 launching. And the more he thinks, the more he thinks he might've made a mistake in buying those things and should have waited till the end of the year. So Juan, you have a PC right now with the 5800X in it that I'm guessing you are using to some extent. So consider between right now and whenever AM5 launches, which we don't know when it will exactly happen, probably Q3, maybe Q4 timeframe, all the time you spend using your system between now and then is time that you would have not had a system had you not bought your 5800X. Speaking a little bit more generally though, this is one of those problems and dilemmas that plagues PC gamers, I think, just in general, which is that at no matter what point you decide to drop the cash and build your system, around the corner, there's going to be something newer and something faster that launches. And sometimes it's even cheaper. Not always, especially if you're looking at graphics cards like in 2020, but it is often the case. Now, I would say when you get to a point where, you know, you're within a month or so of the launch and maybe it's been officially announced and there's a date, at that point, I think it might be a little bit more reasonable to say, you know what, I'm gonna hold off and see what happens with the new platform. And I'm sure we will get to that point later in this year, but for you and anyone else who has recently invested in new PC gaming hardware, don't feel bad. Use your system. Let it bring you joy and time playing games. And remember, sure, you could have waited, but if you had waited, then you wouldn't be enjoying the PC that you have now. The last question is not really a question. This is from WL, and uh, this is from the last probing Paul, and he mentioned shipping me some beers in early January, and they got returned because they were unclaimed at the PO box. I was actually really happy when I spotted this about a month ago because I was able to follow up and apologize for not for just failing and not picking that PO box shipment up in time. But WL, thank you very much for shipping that to me and thank you for being so kind and understanding with my fail and not picking it up. So now we seamlessly transition into mail time. Uh, mail time I uh, do sometimes along with my Q and A's, depending on whether or not I have stuff to open. If you would like to send me something, the PO box uh, is listed down in the video's description. And like I said, I check it every uh, week or two, and then I do like I'm doing today and I open it up. Oh look, we have a mysterious note that says, read me, read me. <laughs> So this package is from someone named Dow, and they wrote a very nice handwritten letter, and, and don't worry, I'm able to read this just fine. They learned a lot about PC building from my channel, and then from there they've expanded other channels like uh, Bitwit, J's Two Cents, Gamers Nexus, and uh, he regrets not being able to send me beer, but apparently during the pandemic, Dow picked up a bit of a side hobby, side hustle, I don't know what you want to call it, but this is apparently moonshine. That's right. Apple pie flavored moonshine, which Dow says he's been told is quite strong. It's even got a seal on the top, although it looks like it popped off a little bit during shipping. And I, I guess I have no choice but to give this a shot. That was totally an unintentional pun. All right, I've got my Paul's hardware shot glass here. Funny story uh, for those of you who believe me, and I don't really have anything to back this up or a basis for it. But I'm told that back during the prohibition times that my uh, like great grandmother was a bootlegger which I'm very proud of. Ooh, wow. That really does smell just like apple pie. Like it's all apples and cinnamon. Ooh, nice amount of thickness to it there. Dow, thank you very much for sending this over and uh, don't feel bad at all that you didn't send beer because this smells like it's gonna be delicious too. Cheers. That's amazing, that's so good. It's not super strong. I mean, I can tell it's alcoholic. It's probably stronger than beer or something like that. That tastes way too good. Dow, good job. Thank you for sending this over. Thank you for watching my videos. Actually, I'm pouring myself a little bit more here. Just, you know, just to sip on, just to sip on while we finish opening the packages. Next up, I have a letter. This is from uh, Victor Gonzalez, opening letter. Oh, look. Victor, look at that. Photographic proof and everything. 
<laughs> so you guys might be aware that there are spammers in the YouTube comments section. It's a plague. They will not go away. There's various ways to solve it. Like Theo Joe has a tool you can use or you can go in manually and like hide them from channel and stuff. But for us creators, it really sucks because these are just scammers going on trying to scam people. And they always post these comments saying like, hey, here's a WhatsApp number or something. I do not have WhatsApp. I do not have Telegram. All the giveaways I have run have been through gleam.io. You enter an email address and then I email you at that email address directly from me. And I also offer you various ways to confirm that it's actually me if that's necessary. But Victor here who sent me a picture and he's wearing my shirt and everything. So Victor, thank you so much uh, for shopping on my store and everything. Sent me copies of the YouTube replies saying he won. And I'm not exactly sure if he's thinking I will respond back to this letter and say, yes, Victor, here is the height Y60 that I already to a dude who actually won it in Hawaii. But anyway, if you weren't already aware, watch out for the spam comment replies in the YouTube comment section. They'll take my picture, pretend to be me, and try to get you to contact them on WhatsApp or whatever, and they'll say like, oh, you won. All you have to do is pay for shipping. And then they'll try to get you to send them, you know, 50 bucks or 100 or whatever they think you can get away with. And once you send them money, poof, they're gone and you have been scammed. That's all I've got as far as fan scent stuff. So like I said, guys, I haven't been promoting it as much because I kind of skipped doing the Q&A bits for a few months there at the end of last year. But if you want to send me something, by all means do so. And maybe I will open it up and check it out in next month's Probing Paul. This box was sent over by Asus. And if you watched my RTX 3090 Ti SLI video a couple weeks back, and maybe also the tech news I followed it up with that weekend, you might have encountered uh, some of the dilemmas that I experienced with that, which is that the Asus R ROG Hero motherboard that I had been using on my test bed for quite some time actually does not support SLI. But what does support SLI in that lineup? Uh, just the top three SKUs, which includes the Apex, the Glacial or whatever the water-cooled one is, and the Extreme. This is a crazy high-end motherboard and I have a couple different plans for it. One is that I am gonna be following up that 3090 Ti SLI video with a little bit more testing. I thought that'd be a good idea. People seemed interested. And the reason this board is suitable for that is uh, not just the fact that it actually supports SLI, something that I gave Asus quite a hard time about with the Hero board, which is 600 bucks and in my opinion should. But this one is, you know, EATX, back plates, all the highest end features as the ROG Maximus Extreme board usually has, but it also has four slot spacing for the uh, two main PCI Express slots right there. And if you're trying to do SLI with 30 series, most of the bridges manufactured are four slot spacing. And if you're trying to do it with 3090 Ti's, like I've still got a couple of over here, they're all like three slot plus cards. So you kind of want that spacing. So this will theoretically allow me to test that setup with like a 12900K or maybe a 12900KS. And most of the highest scores on 3 d Mark for Port Royal, which is kind of the only practical use of SLI at this point, is chasing after those synthetic benchmarks. But most of those rigs were using Intel 12th gen processors. But I didn't stop there in prepping for uh, part two or my second attempt at that. I also hit up EVGA and they were kind enough to send this little care package over which includes an EVGA SLI bridge for 30 series. This is still a four slot spaced one. It's just finished an EVGA trim instead of the uh, stock NVIDIA one like I have over there. Both of them will work just fine in the same fashion. But the other issue that I had is the two 3090 Ti's that I was using were two different PCB designs from two different manufacturers. One being the MSI Supreme model and the other being the Pellet GameRock. So EVGA being the kind people that they are, sent these over to RTX 3090 Ti F FTW3s. These are for the win three cards. I think one of them might be the OC version. I think these are slightly different models, but they still have the same exact PCB layout and everything. So the SLI bridges here are at the exact same position on the PCB. So when the cards are positioned like this side by side, those SLI bridges line up and you won't have to do like I did using ribbon cables to uh, accommodate cards that were a little offset, kind of like that. EVGA is letting me borrow these two cards, not keep, but, but I'm okay with that. It's just for some quick testing. I have two other 3090 Ti's anyway. I don't need, I don't need to keep these. I don't even want to keep them. They're 
Okay, I kind of do. But uh, the question in my mind, and I don't know if you guys are thinking about it too, is uh, what are the fastest CPUs for gaming right now? You've got the 12900K or 12900KS on the Intel side. And then for AMD, you have the 5800X3D that was just recently launched. In my initial tests, in the synthetic 3D Mark test, the 5800X3D didn't really make much of a difference, but I didn't test Port Royal and I wasn't testing two-way 3090 Ti's or anything like that. So EVGA also sent this over, the X570 Dark, among the first AMD motherboards that EVGA has created, and this board also has four slot spacing, so I can install both of these cards with proper spacing and not have to use riser cables. And that should allow me to try out the 5800X3D if I wish, or the 12900K on the ASUS Extreme board. So I now have a bunch of alternative hardware solutions that I can try out and see if I can push my 3090 Ti two-way SLI testing a little bit further. I might even pipe in the AC unit, see if I can cool the cards down and get some more megahertz out of them that way. But that video should be up later this week, so if you're not subscribed, uh, definitely do so, so you can be notified when that video goes live. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and if you have any questions for me to answer in the next Probing Paul, leave those in the comment section down below. You can also find a link to my store at paulshardware.net down in the video description. Buy yourself some merch, you can get shirts, mugs, pint glasses, beer sets, and more. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button on your way out too, that really helps me out. Thank you guys so much again for watching this video, and we'll see you all in the next one.